In this lesson, we're going to start tackling rates of return. Now, your curriculum wants you to know many ways to compute the rate of return. So we're just going to make a start in this lesson and then explore these topics further. But, you know, before I proceed with anything, let me map everything out so that you get, get a better idea and a better sense of what we're trying to achieve here. The um, three kind of most basic rates of return that I'm going to explore in this lesson are going to be what's known as the HPR. Now, this stands for holding period return. Don't worry, we'll write this name down for the, um, in just a moment. Um, then we're going to explore also as part of this lesson, the so-called arithmetic mean return. Now, this is very simple. It's just a simple arithmetic average, but also something a bit more complicated known as the geometric mean return, the geometric mean return. And this, these are going to be the topics for, um, for this lesson, at least. Now, the final one, this geometric is going to be quite important because it will appear also under a different name later on. It's going to be called the time-weighted uh, rate of return, which we're going to cover in a, in a later lesson. However, then it's going to have a, uh, a different name. Now, in the next lesson, we're going to um, talk about ways to compute a rate of return or an average, to be honest, rate of return, where we need to deal with extreme values, uh, so-called outliers. How do you deal with, uh, you know, a, a set of data where one or two of the elements, one or two of the observations are completely different to everything else? And therefore, certainly classic measures like the arithmetic mean may drive us to compute um, values, mean values, which are unrepresentative for the wider whole. So in the next lesson, we're going to be dealing with extreme values and uh, what your curriculum wants you to know in this respect is how to compute the harmonic mean, which also has other uses. Um, for example, in cost averaging, something we'll do as part of a question the trimmed mean, as well as something called the Windsorized mean. You don't really need to know how to do this. You need to understand the process, but I wouldn't expect questions specifically on how to, you know, apply the concept. Then, in the lesson after that, so, you know, further lesson, let's call it like that. Um, we're going to come back to the computation of different um, rates of return and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss so-called special or specialized measures of return or return measures. And when I say specialized, I mean things like gross versus net return, meaning with the inclusion of fees or without the inclusion of fees, uh, or indeed pre-tax versus after-tax, things like that. Another one which uh, you need to absolutely appreciate is real returns, meaning adjusted for inflation, as well as something you need to do computationally, leveraged returns. So this is when we um, finance an investment, not only with our own money, that's called equity, but also with borrowed money, so leveraged returns. Okay, so that's going to be a further lesson. And even later on, you know, at the lesson after that one, so let me say over here, next, uh, but following this one, we're going to discuss some return measures which are absolutely critical. That's the MWR, that's the money-weighted return, and the time-weighted return. And if there is a single thing that you learn from this topic, make sure you know how to do MWR and TWR, because I can predict, maybe not with certainty, but I definitely think these topics are going to come up on the exam. It's so important. But you know, the good thing is that the geometric mean, which we'll be learning about here, 
comes under a different name over here. It's called the TWR. So what you learn over here will reinforce what we, what we already do here as well. Now, with this mapping of the different rates of return, the different mean measures that you're going to have to learn, let's proceed with some specific um, knowledge on the HBR arithmetic and geometric aided by questions. As we said, our starting point is going to be something called the holding period return, also known as the HPR. And let's have a look at a question on this topic specifically. The table below gives the annual total returns for an actively managed fund since its inception four years ago. Then you see the returns over a period of four years. Now, the fund's holding period return for the four-year period is closing to closest to. This is a really simple question, meaning, you know, how much does an investment grow if it was invested in this fund over the accumulated effect of these four years? Now, in order to compute the cumulative HPR, which is effectively what you may be asked to do in the, um, in the exam, is absolutely don't just add these percentages. That's not how it works. We need to take into account the effect of compounding, the fact that, you know, um, if we invested $100 um, at the very beginning, let's say, you know, over here, uh, then it would accordingly grow by uh, 4% to reach a level of uh, 104. And then this 104 would then subsequently grow by 5.5%. So this doesn't lend itself just to adding percentages. You need to be a little bit more sophisticated and you need to have, follow a formula that you'll get very much used to. The HPR or the basically the return, the cumulative return over uh, the period, which is what we're going to be asked here is, the uh, let me open some square brackets because we will need them. The effect of taking one plus the first rate of return that's four percent. Now multiply this by one plus the second rate of return that's five and a half for the second year. Um, then multiply this by one minus eight point six percent, and finally, of course, one plus uh, one point two percent. Um, close off the square brackets and in order to get a return here measure deduct the one the one is essential so that we can do these multiplications but after we've done the multiplications uh, we can easily deduct the one so what does that actually give in terms of inputs into our calculators which we're going to do in just a moment that's going to give 1.04 over here one plus five and a half percent so multiplied by 1.055. The next one, now this is tricky, isn't it? Because you need to deduct 8.6% from one. And uh, feel free to do this on the calculator. In fact, let's get the calculators out and do this because this is the one where many people make a mistake. So I've got my calculator in my hand and let's do one minus 8%. Now 8% is 0 0.086, isn't it? So that's going to give, uh, as we can see, 0 0.914, uh, where's my pen? Here it is. So times 0 0.914. And the final one, this is tricky as well, because um, what the mistake many people make is they, they, you know, they turn this into 1.12, which is wrong. It's 1.012. If you wrote, what, if we did 1.12, that would be 1 plus 12 percent, not 1 plus 1.2 percent. So um, we've got this. This needs to be multiplied out, and we need to deduct 1 from it. So um, let's have a go. 1.04 times 1.055 times 0 0.914 times 1.012. Let's deduct one. And um, I'm looking at an answer that reads 0 0.01487. If I want to turn this into a nice percentage, multiply by 100, and I can see that this is one point, well, roughly 49%, isn't it? So um, that seems to be uh, the correct answer. Uh, to the uh, to the problem, um, and it corresponds very nicely with uh, with answer A um, from the uh, from the question. Now, as I said before, 
What this rate seems to should suggest is that following a period of four years, we should be 1.49% better off, richer, if we invest into this um, uh, fund uh, whose returns we are presented with. Let's check if that actually works. So we already know that during the first year, an initial 100 hypothetically invested into the fund would uh, increase to four, by 4% 4 to 104. Now, what would happen in the subsequent year? Well, obviously, this um, would be equivalent to multiplying by a factor of 1.04, which is effectively what we're doing here. Then uh, we would need to multiply 104 by a factor of 0 0.55 to account for the 5.5% um, growth. Let me quickly do this, 104 times 1.055, we would get to 109.72. Uh, then in the next year, there would be that drop. So drop of 8.6% means we drop to a level which is identified as a factor of 1.914. So let me quickly do this on the calculator. And I see, and I'm rounding things up already here a little bit, 100.28. And, you know, the final period of growth, final year, that's a factor of 1.012. Let me quickly do this on my calculator. Uh, and I'm looking at 101 point, well, if I round it up to two decimal places, 49. So... If I start with an assumed 100, I'll end up with $1.49 more. And this is what the uh, holding period return tells me because it shows the cumulative rate of growth plus 1.49%. And that's what it's useful for. Time to move on to the next two types of rate that we're going to discuss in this lesson and that's the arithmetic mean return and the geometric mean return and here's a question on these two that's going to um, explore the computation and the properties of the two the table below gives the annual total returns for an actively managed fund hey it's the same one that we had before in the holding period return uh, question since its inception four years ago same numbers now the question is the fund's arithmetic and geometric mean annual returns are closest to. Um, I guess everybody should know how to uh, compute the arithmetic mean. Um, it's, it's such a basic thing. Um, so arithmetic mean return would be um, computed just by simply taking the numbers 4% plus Five and a half percent minus eight point six percent, and obviously add one point two and deduct this total by the number of observations. Number of observations here is the number four. Let's take the calculator and see what we get. Four plus five point five minus eight point six and add one point two, divide by four. Okay, zero point. Um, 525 or 0.53% uh, if we round this up um, to uh, two decimal places. And, you know, there are two answers, uh, B or C. We've narrowed it down to B or C, which have the arithmetic mean stated as 0.53%, but we still don't have the correct answer. And to be honest, um, if you wanted to, you'd need to complete the geometric mean unless you know a certain property that I really, really want you to stick into your heads. It's it's one that is easily testable um, in the exam. There is, without telling you yet what the geometric mean is, please always remember that the arithmetic mean is going to be, in most cases, higher than the ge geometric mean or equal to. But this equal to... So um, the equality will only happen if all the observations, i.e. these uh, individual you know, yearly returns, um, are equal. That's, um, that's the condition. 
That's when um, the arithmetic and geometric mean are the same. Uh, if not, if there is any variance, if any there is any you know this range here, as as you see, uh, the arithmetic mean is going to be higher than the geometric mean. So the only answer that realistically satisfies this condition, satisfies this criterion, is going to be answer B, isn't it? That's the one where arithmetic mean is higher than geometric mean. Now, um, what is therefore the geometric mean? Well, the geometric mean is a, is a, is another way of computing the mean rate of return, and it addresses a very significant problem associated with the arithmetic mean. And it's a problem that I'm going to write down because it's a certain assumption that we inherently make when we compute the arithmetic mean uh, as a way of describing or averaging returns. The assumption is that um, the amount invested is equal um, in each period. So, you know, that the same $100 is invested at the very beginning and then grows at 4%, but then subsequent years growth is also applied to $100. That's when you would be Absolutely, um, let's say, when, when it would be fine to average using the arithmetic mean. However, in investing, uh, it's not the case that the amount invested every year is the same because amounts grow by what has already uh, been earned in previous periods. And we've got this effect of compounding. And due to compounding, or in order to address that effect, we... Um, compute the geometric mean. Now, the geometric mean, let me write it out for you maybe here, is very um, constructionally, very similar to what we did before when we did the holding period return. So essentially, in individual brackets, I'm going to have one plus the, you know, the return for the first period, the holding, you know, period return from the first period, then uh, multiplied by one plus the return for the second period, and you know, add um, dots to signify that this can you know this list can go on all the way up to one plus r n, where n stands for the number of periods. And when we did this before, or when we applied this formula to compute the cumulative holding period return, um, I deducted one. I'm going to do the same thing here, but also and this is a critical step. I'm going to take um, a root, or the, to be more precise, the nth root here. So n is, of course, the number of periods. Good. How do we translate this into our specific problem in this question? Well, what we're going to have is, to compute the geometric mean, is we're going to have 1.04, that's the first rate of return, times 1.055, second one, times, uh, well, 1 minus 8.6, and we kind of previously already computed this to be 0 0.914, didn't we? And then um, 1.012, very easy to omit that zero. I'm saying that from, you know, from past, uh, from past mistakes. Now, in order to be able to do this on our calculator, which is something we're going to do in just a moment, we've got to realize a very specific relationship. If I'm, you know, if we're asked to take n, you know, the nth root of any number, like here, whatever is underneath the, the root, but, you know, the nth root, that is equivalent to taking that number, the x, and raising it to the power of 1 over n. And we're going to use that relationship on our calculators in just a moment. So I'm going to ask you in a moment to raise this to the power of 1 over 4, because that's equivalent to taking the fourth, um, the fourth root. And obviously, deduct 1 as well. Good. So let's see what that gives. 1.04 times 1.055 times 0 0.914 times 1.012, okay, press the equals key here, and then to do this uh, raising to the power of 1 over 4, you have to hit the y to the power of x button, which is just directly above the 9 key, 
And, you know, here you can open brackets and do 1 divided by 4, close brackets, or just type in 0 0.25 straight away and deduct the 1. Okay, what does that give? That gives, now look, if you want to be sure you get this number right, multiply by 100 because then it's easier to read. This is 0. Point, roughly 0.37%. Let's write this down. 0.37%, and that only kind of reinforces the uh, the conclusion that we already made before. The answer is answer B, because it says geometric mean is 0.37. What does the geometric mean stand for? Well, how do we interpret it? It's the rate which we would need to earn each year or each period in order to match the actual cumulative return achieved. Now I'm writing this out because it's an important result. The rate which we would need to earn each year to match the actual cumulative return. From the previous question that we did on the holding period return, we know what would happen if you invested 100 over here, right? This would grow by 4% in the first year, and then that would grow by 5.5%, that would, you know, that would fall by 86 and this would subsequently grow by 1.2%. And we already did this, however, let me just take the time to, to do this again. We know this would be 104, then this 104 would grow by a factor of 1.055, so as to reach 109.72, then this would fall but we would multiply, achieve that fall by multiplying by a factor of 0 0.914, I mean, stuff that we did already, right? Zero, 100, sorry, 0.28. And ultimately, this would rise by a factor of 1.012, 1, which leaves us looking at 101.49, so something that we did before already. Now, that's the actual cumulative return from 100 to 101.49 and we know that's growth of 1.49 percent the geometric mean which came in at 0 0.37 is telling us well you could get the same end result if for four periods in a row four years in a row you allowed the initial 100 to grow at 0 0.37 annually. So let's see what would happen here. If we started with the same kind of hypothetical 100 and we allowed that to grow at 0 0.37 every year, we would end up multiplying four times in a row by a factor of 1.037, wouldn't we? Once twice for the third time and the fourth time and let's see what would happen 100 multiplied by 1.037 now i got this one wrong this is the problem we need to be extra careful to get the number of zeros right here so it's not 1.037 is it it's 1.0037 because it's 0 0.37. See how easy it is to make these mistakes? Again, 100 times 1.0037 and raise this to the power of 4. 101.49. Hey, it's the same result as over here. So the geometric mean at 0.37% is indeed the rate which we would need to earn each year to match the actual cumulative return. We just proved that. I want to finish off our exploration of the arithmetic and geometric mean by giving you a further, more extreme example of the two. So uh, imagine you've got a fund um, that invests over a period of two years. So this is time zero, the beginning, end of year one, end of year two. And let's assume that in the first year, the fund manager delivers spectacularly good performance, 100% growth. Whereas in the second year, 50% uh, decrease. And 
if, uh, just like before, we imagined $100 being initially invested here, where would this take us? Well, you know, in the first year, we would multiply by 1 plus 100, so 1 plus effectively 1, so by a factor of 2, and that would raise us, increase the amount, uh, the value of the investment to 200, only to see this drop, uh, you know, multiply by a factor just like before, 1 minus 50% uh, or 1 minus 0 0.5, so a factor of 0 0.5, dropping us again to 100. And let's see what would happen if we calculated the two <laughs> mean rates of return, starting with the, over here, maybe the arithmetic mean. Well, if you wanted to calculate the arithmetic mean, you would simply say, well, one period was plus 100, the other period was negative 50. So on average, um, you know, divide by two, sorry, number of observations, number of periods, well, that's going to give one, you know, 50 divided by two plus 25% on average growth. And you'd be perfectly fine to make that statement given that this is the arithmetic mean. Whereas if asked to compute the geometric mean, let's apply the same methodology as we introduced before. So, you know, let's have one plus um, the return from the first period, which was 100%, that's one, multiply by one minus uh, the return for the second period, so one minus 0 0.5. Um, take the root of this to the power of the number, you know, equal to the number of periods, the nth root, so that's going to be the square root, and deduct one. Okay, so what that does, what does that give? It gives two times, uh, effectively, times 0 0.5, which comes in at one, and uh, we're supposed to take the square root of this. Well, the square root of one is simply one, and if we deduct one, we end up looking at zero, at an answer of zero. Now, this is a very useful measure, because if somebody asks you, well, how did your investment do? You invested 100, and uh, on average, how much did you make per year? You would say, well, I, I invested 100, I ended up extracting 100, so on average, I kind of earned zero. And the geometric mean is our preferred way of measuring average returns, or average return, over multiple periods. So if you have to compute the average return over multiple periods, um, this is a brilliant one. It, you know, it, it captures how the returns are linked over time. Whereas the arithmetic mean is going to be our, well, maybe less useful way of computing the average, but nevertheless, it is still you know, it, it has its uses, although they're a little bit limited. It's the average return over a single period. So if you, you know, asked over a single year, how well did this manager do? Um, you would say, well, they did 101 period minus 50 in the other. So on average, that's 25% in a single period. But the if, if you're asking me over for the average over multiple periods, which is more useful from an investor's perspective, we're going to have to say it was zero. So both mean returns or both ways of computing the mean return have their uses and you're supposed to know which one to apply when.